Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. This is the first reaction video I'm recording post Italy. Uh, so I've got a little bit of sun now, so it feels good. Good to be back in the chair, back to doing some reaction videos. We are going to dive back into some Roman history today and we're going to pick up with the story of Julius Caesar uh, from our friends at Historia Civilis. We're not going to do every single one of their videos because it's an extensive list. Uh, so we're going to go right to the meat of the story uh, in what ends up resulting eventually in Caesar being made dictator, being assassinated, and then eventually uh, rolling right into the events of civil war and eventually of uh, Caesar's adopted son and grandnephew uh, becoming the first emperor of the Roman Empire. So uh, I'll put the link down in the description, as always, so you can check it out without my commentary. Check out all of the other fantastic content at Historia Civilis. But this is Caesar Crosses the Rubicon. want to give a shout out, a thank you to Daniel from Jarfala in Sweden. Thank you so much for your support on Patreon. If you'd like to consider becoming a patron, uh, you can check out the link in the description of every single video. Uh, to see the perks available at all the different levels. Uh, it's a, a tremendous way to show support for this channel, and it helps way more than you know. Let's go ahead and dive in. The conquest of Gaul should have been the apex of Julius Caesar's career. The experience transformed him into Rome's richest citizen and its second most accomplished general. Politically, he was more popular than ever, and an entire generation of young politicians now considered him the leader of their faction. In three years, he would be eligible to run for consul for the second time, and was projected to win in a landslide. It seemed that Caesar would dominate Roman politics for the rest of his life. So, you know, just setting the stage, obviously, like most of history, when you have a general who is uber successful on the battlefield, and there have been few in history who have been as successful as Julius Caesar, and you couple that with wealth, with influence, with uh, family and other connections, uh, some people are going to see that as coattails to latch onto, and other people are going to see you as a threat. And that's what starts to happen. People start to kind of polarize either for or against him. And they form factions based on this man. And one of the, the, the men who's going to become a focus of the opposition to Caesar is a man who was at one time his son-in-law, uh, Pompey. Pompey Magnus, as they call him. Pompey the Great. He's really the only guy who can rival Caesar in any way in terms of influence and popularity as a general and as a politician. Instead, a little over two years after his victory at Elysia, Caesar marched on Rome, and the Roman Senate declared him an enemy of the Republic. How could this happen? Let's answer that question. In the aftermath of Elysia, Caesar was beginning the decades-long process of transitioning Gaul from an unruly frontier to a Roman province. See, this is one of the things that sets the Roman Republic and then later Empire apart from most great empires or great nations that are built, is their ability to assimilate these new territories that they conquer into the empire. It's, it's the... the the groundwork that has been laid for generations to know how to do this, to integrate the people, to Romanize the territory, to update everything, to help these people to no longer identify as a conquered people, but as a part of this greater Rome. But there was only so much he could do as governor. For the sake of administration, Caesar had simply thrown his conquests into the province of Transalpine Gaul. That's too big. Eventually, Gaul would need to be partitioned, but this would require new legislation from the Senate. Moreover, Caesar spent the last several years buying off Gallic aristocrats with promises of Roman citizenship. Failure to deliver on this would jeopardize his new conquests. However, this would also require separate legislation from the Senate. See, this is where you get into a danger zone when you start making promises which 
you need to make at the time because there's no way Caesar can just bounce around with an army defeating Gaul after Gaul after Gaul. There are just too many of them. So there has to be another way besides just winning victories on the battlefield uh, to get these people pacified. And when you make promises that you don't really at the time have the authority to follow through on, you're kind of betting the present on your future ability to deliver on that. Uh, and so all of this really matters because when people talk about the story of Caesar, they talk about his, it, it's almost like we talk about, okay, wins all these victories in Gaul, and the next thing you know, he's marching on Rome with a legion and becoming a dictator. And in order to understand why he got to that place where he marched on Rome, that wasn't his first choice. And, and there were many opportunities where they tried to avoid getting to that state. I'm glad he's talking about this stuff because all of this is the underlying cause. Everything's connected. Things don't just happen one day. You know, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in 1914 only causes World War I because of many, many, many underlying factors that have happened over decades. Caesar only marches on Rome after crossing the Rubicon because of decades of other events and underlying factors. Then there was his army. To conquer Gaul, Caesar had mobilized 50,000 soldiers. Most of these men were now approaching retirement, which usually meant that they received a plot of land from the mm. government. If Caesar could find a way to settle these people in Italy, voters. his 50,000 veterans would become 50,000 voters. That was enough to swing elections. But that, like everything else, would require its own legislation from the Senate. To put it quite simply, the Senate had to uphold Caesar's conquests with new legislation. And so this is the trouble when you are a general, but you've also been a politician and he's been consul. He's been in the Senate. He's been there. So he knows a lot of these guys. Uh, you, you don't want to see all this work go for nothing, but you also don't want to see the promises that you've made be left unfulfilled and have all of your conquests rolled back because these people who you've gotten on your side turn against you. Currently, that wasn't happening. In order to make it happen, Caesar would need to be elected consul for the second time. Too, too early. I think it's every 10 years you could be consul for one year. Back in Rome, the city was still recovering from a dark period in its history. A few years earlier, angry politicians had taken advantage of dysfunction in the Senate, and gangs of armed supporters had taken control of the streets. For a while, it seemed that the Republic may be taken down by an angry mob. In a moment of desperation, the Senate turned to Rome's other most popular politician, Pompey, Pompey and empowered him to restore order. Pompey was a popular politician and a skilled general, but he wasn't one of those guys with strong ideological beliefs. That's a kind way of putting it. Some of his less kind contemporaries describe him as stupid. In his new role, Pompey surrounded himself with conservatives, and we can say with some confidence that the more he did this, the more conservative he became. Boy, isn't that true in life? When we surround ourselves with only with people who think like we do uh, and say what we want to hear, we just become more of what we already are. And that's not growth. That's not wisdom. Uh, you know, I love people like Abraham Lincoln, for example, who surrounded himself with People who thought they were better than he was at doing the job of president, that they would do a better job. People that thought he was an idiot. But he surrounded those people, uh, surrounded himself with those people because he knew he needed to hear their voices. Uh, that's why Doris Kearns Goodwin calls her book Team of Rivals, because these were rivals. Putting people in your circle of influence who aren't afraid to disagree with you and say things you need to hear, that's wisdom. Pompey's obviously not doing that. In the year 52 BCE, Rome received a double whammy of good news. Pompey restored order to the streets, and Caesar won an unprecedented victory against the Gauls at Elysia. After so many years of uncertainty, Rome could now feel secure both at home and abroad. The city erupted into celebration. In the midst of this wave of public support, all ten tribunes of the plebs backed a bill that would allow Caesar to stand for election in the year 49. With and why does this matter? Because the tribunes of the plebs had veto power. 
So any legislation that, that was passed, they could veto it. So you need all of them to support it because of that veto power. Which veto just literally means I forbid this from happening. Uh, so you've got to get those guys. They have a lot of power. Out having to leave Gaul, the bill passed into law. Let's pause here. Why did Caesar and his allies want this? Rome had a strict rule that forbade governors and generals from entering the city. Even Pompey, who was technically the governor of the two Spanish provinces, was forced to take up residence just outside the city limits. But Rome had another rule, which said that all candidates for office had to stand for election in person, in the city. So what did governors who wanted to stand for election do? One rule saying that they could not enter the city, and another saying that they must. Usually, they just resigned six months early, and yep. entered Rome as a private citizen. But Caesar didn't want to do that. Why? Because while in office, consuls and governors were immune from legal prosecution. And here is such an important key, key to all of this. So much of what motivates Caesar during this time, we've already talked about the promises that he's made and, and the people that he needs to keep happy. Uh, but this immunity from prosecution is paramount in understanding all of this. We should remind ourselves why legal immunity was so important to Caesar. During his year as consul, Caesar illegally passed legislation after it was vetoed by his co-consul and several tribunes of the plebs. He oversaw and perhaps ordered the assault of a fellow consul. He incited a riot. He arrested a senator for political reasons. I could go on. As consul, Caesar showed no respect for the rule of law. Cato, one of the leaders of the conservative faction, went so far as to swear an oath to personally lead the prosecution of Caesar whenever his legal immunity expired. Prosecution would endanger all of Caesar's legislative accomplishments. Banishment was also a possibility. These guys weren't playing around. Were Cato and the conservative faction coming after Caesar for political reasons? Yes. Was Caesar guilty of these crimes? Also yes. Also yes. The point being, there's nobody here who <laughs> isn't motivated by something. And, and, and the problem is that you need the right people to back down. You need some kind of compromise. And this is just one of so many examples throughout history where neither side backs down in the end. Long story short, Caesar didn't want to risk battling it out in the courts. The conservative faction was well connected, and if it came down to it, he might lose. That's why, at the urging of Caesar's supporters, the tribunes of the plebs passed a law permitting Caesar to stand for election in absentia. This way, he could transition seamlessly from governor to consul, and then from consul to governor again, extending his legal immunity yep. indefinitely. Cato and the conservatives were pretty upset by this law. They pushed back, and the Senate descended into a heated debate over the issue. Pompey, as Rome's leading citizen, decided to stay above the fray. Caesar should have been annoyed that the conservatives in the Senate were coming after him like this. As far as he was concerned, he was abiding by the letter of the law. Besides, earlier in Pompey's career, he had done the same thing, and nobody batted an eye. And there you have it, I mean, in a nutshell, is that people who are indignant over what they see as someone violating the law when people on their own side had done the same thing. The, the hypocrisy that exist to this day in politics. How many times do we see one side complaining about what the other side does, but then the first chance they get, their side does the same thing, and then they're like, well, they did it, why can't I? And then vice versa. Uh, everybody's a hypocrite in this situation. It's also worth reminding ourselves that Pompey was serving as consul in the year 52, even though he was legally prohibited from doing so. This fact was definitely not lost on Caesar. If the yep. Senate was going after him, why weren't they going after Pompey? And this is actually going to lead to one of the opportunities that Caesar is going to give for them to resolve this crisis, where he's going to say, well, you know what? I'll stand down as long as Pompey does too. But Caesar's very calculated. He's not only a great general, he's a great strategist in general, which means that uh, he's also a good political strategist. And he has a pretty good 
grasp of how to handle these situations. He makes offers he knows will be refused so that he can then look like he rose above the fray. Debate raged in the Senate. The conservative faction tried repealing the law allowing Caesar to stand for election, but the tribunes of the plebs vetoed every attempt at There you go. The two sides were at a stalemate. Caesar had been elected consul in the year 59, and because of Roman law, he was not allowed to run for a second term until the election of the year 49. Immediately after his term as consul, Caesar became the governor of the Gallic provinces for a five-year term, from 58 to 54. In the year 55, with the end of his term in sight, mm. Caesar had the Senate extend his command for an additional five years. Well, here's the question. Where does the extension begin? And I think that's where the rub is in all of this. Now, with the Senate debating Caesar's future, members of the conservative faction went back and examined this law. They discovered that it was quite badly written, and never actually specified when Caesar's second five-year term would begin or end. And, and this happens to this day. That's, that's why we so often have here in the United States the Supreme Court interpreting laws, uh, because the laws leave loopholes, they leave questions unanswered, they leave things open to interpretation. And this is one of those examples. When does his second term begin? And that's where you have that trouble of, is there a gap between the end of his second term and when he can become consul again? The conservative faction took this information and ran with it. They argued that since the law didn't give any specific dates, Caesar's second term actually began the moment the legislation passed. This would mean that his term as governor would expire in March of the year 50, almost two years earlier than expected. And basically what you have here is, is you have both sides are going to argue the, the viewpoint that makes their case. If they want to be able to prosecute Caesar, they need there to be a gap between the end of his second term and when he can become consul so that they've got a window there. And if you're on Caesar's side, you want the opposite to be true. I've said it several times, but it's key to this whole thing, so I'll say it again. Whenever Caesar's command expired, so did his legal immunity. This may seem like a tiny disagreement, but it would have massive yep. ramifications. Absolutely. Obviously, Caesar vehemently disagreed with the conservative faction's interpretation of the law. He argued that even if it was poorly written, the intent was obvious, and subsequent legislation implicitly upheld its original meaning. Fair point. Specifically, he pointed to the law that the tribunes of the plebs had passed in the year 52, which allowed him to retain his command in Gaul while he stood for election in the year 49. The fact that this law existed meant that everybody was in agreement that his command expired in the year 49. And I think he's got a fair argument there in all of that. But again, it all depends on which side you're on. And it's interesting to note that while all of this is going on, Caesar's up in the north of what is now Italy. Uh, and he, he's not directly influencing this stuff. Uh, he's, you know, messages are going back and forth and he's got allies in the Senate and uh, among the tribunes and things like that. And, and the, even in the mob and, 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 you know, people of the city itself, which by this point, Rome was a pretty massive city. Um, so this is all happening from a distance. Kind of interesting. The conservative faction pressed on. They decided to proceed as if they had already won the debate and introduced new legislation to name Caesar's replacement for March of the year 50. Caesar couldn't let this happen, so he flooded the city with bribes, and the bill narrowly went down in defeat. And so again, here you have a situation where more promises are being made, more money is being thrown at this, uh, and at some point Caesar needs a, a return on investment, so to speak. Uh, that means he's got to keep this fight up and he can't negotiate at this point. He can't negotiate for something that's not going to get him everything he needs. Late in the year, Pompey finally decided to weigh in on the debate. He sided with the conservative faction, of course which he did. surprised nobody, and asked Caesar to voluntarily step down before the March deadline. Caesar refused, obviously, and continued to argue that he was on the right side of the law. And to an extent, he was right. Even if you take the conservative faction at their word and accept that there was some ambiguity in the law, they had failed to clarify the issue with additional legislation, 
The question of Caesar's command dominated the elections of that year. Two candidates from the conservative faction were elected consul, and each agreed that Caesar should resign his command by March of the following year. At the beginning of the year 50, one of the new consuls introduced legislation that would force Caesar to step down. The other consul shocked everybody by coming out against the proposal, even though he had been elected on this very issue. Oops. We later learned that Caesar purchased this betrayal with a massive bribe. So, <laughs> again, Caesar's all about the rule of law, but I'm also not above paying for it. You know, so nobody's clean in any of this. With the two consuls split on what to do, there was chaos and confusion in the Senate. Finally, one of the tribunes of the plebs spoke up, saying that if the Senate was going to ask Caesar to step down, they should also ask Pompey to do the there same. You go. Pompey was in this strange position where he had been given the command of the Spanish provinces, but had left the governing to his deputies while he remained politically active in Italy. It was highly unusual. It was highly unusual and certainly violated the spirit of their policies on that. And you can see where if you're Julius Caesar, you're thinking, well, how come he can do that? And they're giving me such a problem with all of this. So it's a fair concern that Caesar has. Caesar's allies in the Senate began to argue that this made them uncomfortable. And if Caesar needed to step down, so did Pompey. Yeah. This is classic whataboutism. Criticize Caesar, what about Pompey? The two it is, but it's true. Uh, I, I'm not defending Julius Caesar. Listen, he, he's doing all of this out of uh, motivation of self-preservation at this point. Uh, but he's not wrong about Pompey either. Situations really had nothing to do with each other. But Caesar's yeah, allies did, drew a false equivalence between the two and accused the other side of hypocrisy. This kept the Senate busy for several months. The conservative faction introduced several bills to formally strip Caesar of power, but each one was vetoed by one of Caesar's tribunes of the plebs. He only needs one. The March deadline came and went. The, the, I guess a way, a modern example uh, that we could compare this to would be when the United Nations uh, Security Council votes on things. And you have the five permanent members who all have veto power, being the United States, uh, Russia, China, France, and the United Kingdom. And there's so many instances where you'll get four of the five uh, and pretty much everybody else strongly agreeing with something. But one of them, usually the United States or the, uh, Russia or China, uh, will veto it. And the same thing happens here with the tribunes of the plebs. With one deadline ignored, the Senate decided to make up a second one. The conservative faction told Caesar that he had until November to step down. This date seems completely arbitrary, and nobody quite knows why they picked it. The bottom line with all of this is that the law is the law until it's inconvenient, and then we're just going to make up whatever we want. My best guess is that they were waiting for Caesar's tribunes of the plebs to leave office in December. There you go. As the months dragged on, the Caesar question continued to dominate Roman politics. Each side vetoed the other's proposals, resolving nothing. Tempers flared. That summer, the Senate sat to discuss the growing threat of Parthia in the East. For once, the two factions could agree on something, and they decided to send two additional legions to Syria. But even this relatively simple procedure became hijacked by politics. For the sake of fairness, the Senate decided that Pompey and Caesar should each contribute a legion to this endeavor. Both men agreed. Caesar started to make preparations, but Pompey pulled a fast one and announced that his contribution would be one of the legions that he had loaned Caesar four years earlier. Caesar had just been bamboozled into giving away 20% of his army. He was not pleased. He visited both legions and announced that for their loyalty, he was doubling their pay and giving each soldier a Gallic slave. My man is just printing money at this point. But remember, he has just conquered Gaul. And with that came a lot of accumulation of wealth, which he is putting to good use in this situation. <laughs> 
This had its intended effect. Instead of marching east, the two legions marched south and set up camp just north of the Alps. The message was unmistakable. The Senate could say whatever it wanted. Caesar's legions weren't going anywhere. Up in, up in the tension. As the year progressed, frustration mounted and public opinion began to shift. Some people began to call on Pompey to take up arms and end this stalemate. It might not be a coincidence that around this time, Pompey got very sick and recused himself from public life for a while. I read one historian that said that Pompey definitely got malaria, and another that said that he was definitely faking. There's really not much evidence to support no the way claim. To know. I kind of think that he was faking it to dodge questions, but that belief is based on nothing, so make up your own mind. And I think there's a, there's a good possibility that both are true. Uh, you know, when you have two extremes, chances are maybe somewhere in the middle is what it is. Maybe he was sick, but not too sick that he couldn't have served, but it became a convenient excuse for him to get away for a while. By the time Pompey returned to public life, he was filled with a new resolve. When somebody asked him what would happen if Caesar refused to step down, he answered, what would I do if my son came at me with a stick? If Pompey ever had any reservations about a direct confrontation with Caesar, they were long gone. In fact, from this point forward, it's safe to say that Pompey was the leader of the conservative faction. In a sense, the Caesar question had become the central ideological issue in Roman politics. Consequent and like I said earlier, uh, when you have very strong personalities who have great accomplishments and have the loyalty of a lot of people, you tend to become a polarizing figure. And people polarize around or you know, either for or against you. And Caesar has become the story. He has become the political issue. We see some of that today with Donald Trump. Uh, it's, it's in many ways become less about the issues and more about being for or against a person. Uh, and he, it's not unique. I mean, this happened many times throughout American history. It's happened many times in the history of other nations. Caesar is just one example. Pointly, it's no longer very useful to think in the terms of a reform faction and a conservative faction. Instead, let's call them the Caesarian faction and the Pompeian faction. Yep, 100%. By and large, Pompeians dominated the Senate, but it's worth mentioning that there was an entire generation of young, radical senators who strongly identified with Caesar. Cicero sought to play the moderate and reconcile the two sides. He argued that Caesar had undeniably won great victories for the Republic and deserved another term as consul. He also argued that it was incumbent on everybody, including Caesar, to acknowledge the supremacy of the law. Cicero Unless proposed a middle path. Unless it's inconvenient to do so, and then we'll just forget about it. Where Caesar subject himself to a slap on the wrist, and then be allowed to run for consul unimpeded. Neither side was interested in what Cicero had to say. Well, and if both sides are unhappy, you're probably on to something. Uh, boy, I've lost track of the number of times that I've given an opinion on something and people who are politically liberal have said that I'm practically a Nazi and people who are politically conservative have called me woke. And when that happens, I think, you know what? Probably hit it perfectly. Month after month, the Senate continued to meet. Month after month, the Pompeians demanded Caesar's resignation. Month after Getting month, nowhere. the Caesarians would answer, what about Pompey's command? Whenever one side got close to passing a piece of legislation, the other side would veto it. So if your opponent is stuck on one particular issue, why not remove that as a, as a concern? Why not, in this situation, take away their argument about Pompey? Have Pompey step down. It's consistent with the law for him to do that. Why not give that up so that your opponent no longer has that as their whataboutism to hurl at you? I think Cicero's plan was probably a great compromise because it would have avoided the issue. The main sticking point for Caesar is this p potential for prosecution. Take that away. Give him a slap on the wrist. Let him serve as consul. And maybe you avoid all of this. Time was running out. Next year, Caesar had every intention of running for consul, and nobody knew what would happen when he did. 
crucial elections were held for the upcoming year, and Pompeian candidates won big, securing both of the consulships. Mark Antony, who had served under Caesar with distinction tribune at the, the Battle plebs. of Elysia, was elected Tribune of the Plebs, making him the highest ranking Caesarian in Rome. And which means that anything that comes up as a law, Caesar's got his right hand man there to veto it. The Senate's November deadline came and went, and for the second time, Caesar refused to step down. In December, the Senate met yet again to discuss the Caesar question. Pompey spoke first. He announced that he was prepared to make a concession. Once Caesar resigned his command, Pompey would agree to do the same. If he does it first, but here's the problem. You've already demonstrated that you're willing to play the game to trick Caesar into something, right? We'll both send a legion. Caesar agrees to send a legion. Pompey says, I'm sending a legion, but it's one of Caesar's legions. So, Mutual he's not going to buy this. All Caesar had to do was step down first. Not going to happen. One of Caesar's men rose to speak. He said that the only way Caesar would even consider something like this was if Pompey was the one to step down first. Yep. The Caesarians had been demanding Pompey's resignation all year, and this precondition had never been part of the negotiations. These guys were moving the goalposts. Did the Caesarians even want an agreement, or were they trying to derail the whole thing? Yeah, I, I feel though, and, and maybe I'm biased towards Caesar a little bit in this situation, but I feel like, the, like I see this from the opposite way. He's talking about the Caesareans moving the goalposts, but I think they've been pretty consistent all the way along in saying, this is what we want from Pompey, and then we'll agree. Now, it may have been that maybe they were playing the game too, and if Pompey had resigned, then Caesar wouldn't have. But I, I feel like that, that was something you had to at least try. We don't know. Pompey saw right through this tactic, and angrily told the Caesareans that he would not leave Rome undefended, with Caesar still in the field. Pompey would step down, but only if Caesar did so first. Not this happening. was the Senate, so they put the whole thing to a vote. Should Caesar resign his command? A majority said yes, but the measure was vetoed by a Caesarian tribune of the plebs. Should Pompey resign his command? A majority voted no, and even so, a Pompeian tribune vetoed it for good measure. This wasn't a great look for Caesar. He couldn't be seen to be defying the will of the Senate. A Caesarian tribune- But the will of the Senate hasn't been expressed because these bills are not being passed. Stepped forward and suggested that the two sides compromise by combining the two bills. This question was put before the Senate. Should Pompey and there Caesar you go. resign their commands simultaneously? This is one of the rare cases where we actually know the final tally of the vote. 370 voted yes, 22 voted no. Despite the Senate's antipathy towards Caesar, most believed that a compromise like this was the only peaceful way forward. And how often in politically volatile times do you actually get such an overwhelming vote like this? And yet it didn't solve the problem. However, most of the Pompeian leadership, including Pompey, Cato, and the two consuls, opposed the compromise. They no longer believed that the Caesareans were negotiating in good faith. If Pompey resigned on a certain date, they had no way of guaranteeing that Caesar would do the same. The whole thing could be a trick. Despite the Senate's overwhelming vote, Pompey reiterated his position that he would only step down if Caesar did so first. This is getting nowhere. Now, both men appeared to be acting in defiance of the Senate. Yeah. This was kind of a brilliant maneuver by the Caesareans. Before the vote, and like I said, if if this is the Caesareans' sticking point, this is the thing that they've clung to the entire time. Take it away from them. If you're serious about this, have Pompey step down, and 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 if Caesar's still not willing to play, uh, then at that point you know. At that point, everybody's going to turn against him. Don't give him that uh, ability to continue to argue his case. Take it away from him. It could be finalized. One of the consuls rose in disgust and screamed at his fellow senators. The enemy is on the march, and your response is to lay down arms? Enjoy being Caesar's slaves. With that, he nullified the vote by dismissing the Senate yeah. and stormed yep. out. 
After being so close to an agreement, the two sides were back where they started. A few days later, it was rumored that Caesar had responded to this news by marching south with four legions. It wasn't true, but nobody knew that at the time. The city broke into a panic. One of the consuls took matters into his own hands and showed up at Pompey's home with a crowd of supporters. The consul presented Pompey with a sword and said, we charge you to march against Caesar and save the Republic. Pompey accepted the sword and answered, I will, if no alternative can be found. Cicero privately confessed his fears in a letter. The current political situation terrifies me. Almost everybody I know wants to avoid a fight and give in to Caesar's demands. Sure, his demands are shameless, but no more shameless than when he asked for a five-year extension to his term as governor. Why and there's the thing. Th that's the point. It didn't have to come to that. And again, I, I know I'm sounding like a, a apologist for Caesar here, but I feel like there were opportunities to prevent this from falling into civil war, which is what ends up happening. Why fight him on this? He closes the letter by bashing Pompey for failing to see Pompey that this conflict idiot. posed an existential threat to the Republic. Shortly after the incident with the sword, Pompey began raising troops in Italy. The Caesarians were apoplectic and attacked Pompey for illegally assembling a legion without the Senate's permission. The Pompeians in the Senate were happy to just look the other way. Like I said, there's nobody clean in all this. Both sides have plenty of blame to go around. For the rest of the year, the Senate continued to call for Caesar's resignation, but every time legislation was introduced, Mark Antony and other tribunes of the plebs vetoed it. You missed your best chance already to stop this. On January 1st, two new Pompeian consuls took office. In the Senate, Antony read aloud a letter from Caesar. Caesar bragged about his achievements in Gaul and his contributions to the Republic. He concluded by saying that if the Senate passed legislation ordering him to step down, he would refuse to comply unless Pompey resigned his command first. Again, there's that same issue the entire time. Take it away from him. Cicero would later call this letter offensive. It was. Caesar's threat didn't go over well in the Senate. Legislation was introduced saying that if Caesar did not resign his command by a third and final deadline, he would be considered an enemy of the Republic. The bill gave Caesar approximately seven days to step down. The Senate voted on the bill, and it was nearly unanimous. Then, Mark Antony vetoed the whole thing. The Senate erupted into chaos. Behind the scenes, key senators decided to ignore the veto and proceed as planned. If Caesar missed the deadline, they would consider it a declaration of war. So again, I mean, the law is the law until we choose to ignore it. Uh, is it ridiculous that a nearly unanimous vote can be vetoed by one ally? Sure it is, but that's the law that you have in place. And it's been in place for a while at this point. Uh, you don't like it, change it. Of course you can't because it would get vetoed. <laughs> Some days later, an elite group of senators met in Pompey's home to see if they could reach some kind of informal agreement. Pompey, Cato, Cicero, and the two consuls for that year represented the Pompeians. Mark Antony and several tribunes of the plebs represented the Caesareans. Cicero cast himself in the role of mediator and attempted to find common ground between the two sides. Mark Antony and the Caesareans came with an offer. Caesar was prepared to step down from two of his three provinces and would agree to relinquish eight of his ten legions. His only condition was that the Pompeians allow him to serve as consul next year. Cicero. So again, I mean, this seems fairly reasonable compared to what you end up with, right? Which is Caesar as a dictator after marching on Rome. You could have gotten this, and it seems something that I think if I'm on the Pompeian side, if, I, if I'm really truly looking for a compromise, this seems pretty reasonable. Cicero would have been happy with this compromise, but the rest of the Pompeians rejected the offer, 
Cicero cornered Mark Antony for a minute, and then came back with a new offer. What if Caesar only kept one legion? This was probably the best deal that the Pompeians could hope for. Yep. Caesar in control of a province and a legion was hardly a threat to the Republic. Cicero, Pompey, and one of the consuls accepted the offer. There you go. But then, as the two sides were coming together, Cato and the other consul spoke up, saying that one of their preconditions to any agreement was that Caesar relinquish all of his legions. Antony responded, saying that Caesar would never accept a deal like that. Negotiations broke down, and Could you imagine went being the guys, the other three guys who have just negotiated this compromise, and then these idiots come in and blow the whole thing up. It seems like every time they got close, somebody got in the way. And sometimes it was on one side, sometimes it was on the other. Went home frustrated. I cannot overstate how close they were to an agreement. They basically had it in their hands. What a mess. And then Cato, that idiot, blew it up. You dark blue square, idiot, royal blue, January whatever it January 7th, which we assume was the date of the Senate's third and final deadline, the Senate passed the Senatus Consultum Ultimum, also known as the Final Act. Uniquely, the Final Act could not be vetoed. All it needed was a simple majority in the Senate. This was basically the Roman equivalent of martial law. It temporarily suspended existing laws, and empowered the consuls to do whatever was necessary to defend the Republic. Both of the consuls were Pompeians, and now they could do whatever they wanted. Both agreed to hand their authority over to Pompey. Three days later, on January 10th, Caesar learned that the Senate had passed the final act. He was wintering with the 13th Legion near the Italian the border. The 13th! He spent the afternoon working, and that evening attended a dinner party. Nothing unusual. Then, under the cover of darkness, Caesar ordered the legion to break camp and march south at first light. While the legion was making preparations, Caesar and a few of his officers loaded into a wagon and headed for the Italian border. They stopped at the Rubicon River, which was an insignificant body of water yeah, that the Romans walk across used it. to mark the border between Cisalpine Gaul and Italy. The law forbade any general from entering Italy unless they were specifically invited to do so by the Senate. Caesar had received no such invitation. He stopped at the north bank of the river and remained there for the rest of the night. In the morning, the 13th Legion caught up with him. Once the legion was in position, Caesar paused for several long moments. Finally, in Greek, he quoted a famous play, Let the die be cast. With that, Caesar ordered the 13th legion across the Rubicon. At that moment, Rome entered a state of civil war. And, you know, probably at the time it didn't seem like, well, it probably did seem like a big deal, because everybody knew that this was the moment that he was violating the law and that there was probably no going back from this. He was either going to win or lose. There's no longer compromise. There's no longer room for negotiation. Uh, but it has gone down in history as this iconic moment where, to this day, we still talk about crossing the Rubicon as this moment, this point of no return. Now, could there have been a negotiation? There's probably still a chance for that. But, but once you declared martial law and gave that power to Pompey, and now Caesar has crossed the Rubicon, you're kind of at that impasse. You're, you, this is going to be decided on the battlefield now. Okay, so I guess that's where we're wrapping up. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, I'm going to put some links up on the screen here in just a minute to some of the other videos that I did from this series earlier on. It was a couple of years ago, so it's been a while. Uh, so I'll probably look a little different. And uh, But if you want to learn more about Caesar's story before all of this, we covered some of those videos from Historia Civilis. Uh, thank you to John in Destrehan, Louisiana, uh, and Patrick in Everett, Washington. Thank you both for your support on Patreon. Could not do it without you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.